Hampshire Democrats, it is good to be here today. It is so good to see you. You know, coming to New Hampshire, to the Democratic Convention, is like having your next door neighbors invite you for a party. It's like family. And we all know that when it comes to fighting for working families, Massachusetts and New Hampshire are strong partners in getting this done. So thank you. Thank you. And I want to start by thanking your terrific United States Senator, Jean Shaheen. She is the best. Yes. You know, from the very beginning and every step along the way, Jeannie has been there with encouragement, with good advice, and with friendship. So thank you, Jean. Thank you. I also want to say a very special thank you to someone who is tough, who is smart, who is independent, your terrific governor, and the next United States Senator from New Hampshire, Maggie Hassan. So I'm going to be in the front lines fighting for Maggie to make sure she joins Jean and me in Washington. Are you going to be part of that fight? Yeah. Are you? Yeah. yeah! All right. Good. Now, a lot of people ask me uh, why I decided to come speak in New Hampshire today. And I just want to explain. I'm here to apologize. <laughs> See, back when I beat Scott Brown in 2012, <laughs> I never expected him to pack up his truck, move to New Hampshire, and become your problem. <laughs> I, I am so sorry. <laughs> sorry, Democrats. I really am. I am very, very sorry about that. All right. But look, speaking of the man who is not your senator, <laughs> I saw the pictures of Scott Brown sitting in the front row at Donald Trump's Manchester speech earlier this week pleased his punch with himself. And I hear that Donald Trump is floating Scott Brown as a possible running mate. <laughs> and I thought, ah, oh, so Donald Trump really does have a plan to help the unemployed. <laughs> you know, though, actually, Scott Brown for vice president makes a certain sense. I, I, I mean that. I think of all the expert advice he can offer Donald Trump. <laughs> Making up lies about me and my family. <laughs> saying weird stuff about his beautiful daughter. <laughs> and let's face it, nobody knows more about losing to a girl than Scott Brown. <laughs> reality TV show. <laughs> Celebrity Apprentice meets The Biggest Loser. <laughs> now look, I know we're having fun here today, but the truth is I'm really not laughing when it comes to elections this November. For a long time we have talked about important elections. When John Kerry took on W, when Obama fought McCain, very important races. But today, we have something new. We are at a crossroads in the election season, shifting from a strong, hard-fought presidential primary to a general election. And we are at a crossroads in this country. On one side, we have the winner of our Democratic primary, Hillary Clinton. Yes, we do. And whether you supported her in the primary or not, we can all say Hillary Clinton is a fighter. She has been on the receiving end of right-wing attacks 
one after another for 25 years, but she doesn't give up and go home. She keeps at it, she keeps fighting for democratic values and fighting to take down an army of right-wing lunatics who will say and do anything to undermine reform in this country. We need fighters in Washington, and that's why I'm fighting to make Hillary Clinton the next president of the United States. Do that. Yes. 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 That's right. That's right. So that's what we've got on one side, and then there's the other side. The big, loud, and I mean loud, elephant in the room, Donald Trump. Okay, you've heard of Donald Trump. Every day we learn more about him, and every day it becomes clearer that he is just a small, insecure money grubber who doesn't care about anyone or anything that doesn't have the Trump name splashed all over it. Every day, it becomes clearer that he is a thin-skinned, racist bully. And every day, it becomes clearer he will never be President of the United States. You bet. That's right. Now there's plenty that I would be glad to talk about, want to talk about, but I want to focus on something that I think should be a big issue in this campaign, and that's opportunity. Who in this great country gets an opportunity, a fighting chance to build something with their lives? You know, in America, going to college used to be the ticket to getting ahead and creating a better life for yourself and your family. But today, millions of young people have seen their dream turn into a nightmare of debt. Right now, according to the Government Accountability Office, the federal government makes a profit off the student loan program. And it is big. The program is on target to produce tens of billions of dollars in profits. Now, Gene Shaheen and I believe that is wrong. That is wrong. So Gene and I have fought side by side to cut the interest rate on student loans and to reduce the cost of college overall. Your other senator, Kelly Ayotte, voted against cutting student loan interest rates. She thinks it's just fine for the government to make a profit off the backs of students who have to borrow money to go to school. So whatever else happens, I guarantee. Maggie Hassan will be fighting side by side with Jean Shaheen and me to cut the costs for our students. That's why we're here. You bet. That's right. You know, the way I see it, there's an important principle at stake here. Higher education should be about investing in students not about making a profit for the government or boosting revenues for rich guys. And that brings us back to Donald Trump. <laughs> ah, Trump University, which his own employees explained was just a big lie and a fraudulent scheme. Now, rather than investing in high quality instructors and counselors to teach classes, Donald Trump put together an army of salespeople to sell, sell, sell those classes. It was like a used car dealership, except that's not fair to use car dealerships. <laughs> Trump's salespeople, but listen to what he did. Trump's salespeople would focus on how much money someone could come up with, then push these prospective students to max out all their credit cards to fork over thousands or even tens of thousands of dollars to Donald. His playbook said, Look for people with problems because they make good targets. Trump even encouraged his sales force to go after elderly people who are just trying to create a little financial security. Now, Trump University failed, and that's no surprise. 
Think about all the other Trump failures. Trump casinos, Trump airlines, Trump steaks, Trump magazines, Trump vodka, Trump mortgage, Trump games, Trump travel, Trump ice, Trump network. Donald Trump is a proven businessman, a proven failure. But unlike the people who got stuck with an overpriced bottle of water or a fatty steak, many of the Trump U victims ended up deep in debt, sometimes tens of thousands of dollars of debt that they had no way to pay off. These were ordinary folks who were targeted because they had problems and Donald Trump saw that he could make a buck off them. Here is a man who builds a business to profit off other people's pain. Donald Trump wants to be commander in chief, but he's only qualified to be fraudster in chief. You bet. So Trump thought at Trump U that he had picked on people who were weak and defenseless, but now they are striking back and they have sued the thin-skinned racist bully. Yeah. So follow what's happening. When he's been called out by his former students and his own employees, what does Trump do? Does he just man up and take his licks? No. <laughs> no. Does he offer people his mo their money back? No. He whines about the press. He whimpers about the students and he complains that the judge can't treat him fairly because long ago his family came from Mexico. So have you heard the latest? Just this week, Trump sent his lawyers back to court to beg and plead that the videos of what he said under oath are kept secret from the American people. Yeah, think about that. His own lawyers admitted those tapes will hurt his campaign. Oh, poor little Donald is shaking in his high-priced Italian loafers, begging the court to protect him, terrified about what happens if those videos go public and he's held accountable. Are you scared, Donald? Well, you should be. We're coming. You bet. You bet. Look, this is how I look at this. While Donald Trump works to tear people down, Hillary Clinton and Democrats work to build them up. That's what we're about. While Donald Trump works to hold people back, Hillary Clinton and Democrats work to move them forward. That's what it's about. And while Donald Trump watches out for exactly one person, Donald Trump, Hillary Clinton and the Democrats work to build a future where not just some of our kids have a chance to get ahead, but all of our kids have a chance to build a future. Yeah. So look, we can whine about Donald Trump, we can whimper about Donald Trump, or we can fight back. Me, I'm fighting back. I'm fighting back. You bet. And Hillary Clinton is fighting back. Democrats are fighting back. And here's the best part, America is fighting back. Yes. Yes. When we stand together, when we make it clear what we believe in, America is ready to stand with us. And why? Because this isn't just about politics. This is about our values. This is about what kind of country we are and what kind of people we are. So let's remind ourselves of what we get up for every day, what we believe in all the way down to our toes. And let's draw some very clear lines. Donald Trump wants to repeal Wall Street reform, but Democrats believe we need accountability on Wall Street and we're willing to fight for it. You bet. 
Donald Trump wants to repeal the federal minimum wage, but Democrats believe that no one should work full time and still live in poverty. That means raising the minimum wage and we will fight for it. Donald Trump is a climate change denier, but Democrats believe in science, that climate change is real, and it is our moral duty to protect this planet for our children and our grandchildren. And we are ready to fight for it. Donald Trump runs a so-called university whose main job seems to be scamming people but Democrats believe that every kid should have a good education without getting crushed by student loan debt. And we're willing to fight for it. Donald Trump says he supports cutting Social Security, and I'm quoting here, from a moral standpoint. But Democrats believe that after a lifetime of hard work, People are entitled to retire with dignity, and that means protecting Social Security, Medicare, and our pensions. And we are willing to fight for it. Donald Trump says he likes to see women on their knees. Well, Donald, that's not happening. <laughs> Democrats believe in equal pay for equal work and a woman's right to decisions over her own body, and we're ready to fight for it. That's right. Be there. We're going to be there. Donald Trump doesn't support marriage equality because he says, and again, I want to quote here, I just don't feel good about it. I just don't feel right about it. Well, Democrats believe that equal means equal in marriage, in the workplace, every place. And we're going to fight for it. We are ready. Yep. So Donald Trump wants to build a wall and tear apart millions of families. But Democrats believe that immigration has made this country strong. That means comprehensive immigration reform now. And we're willing to fight for it. And Donald Trump calls African Americans thugs and Muslims terrorists and Latinos rapists and criminals. But Democrats believe that racism, hatred, injustice, and bigotry have no place in our country. We believe that black lives matter, and we believe that Muslim and Latino families are an important part of the fabric of this great country. And we are ready to fight for American values. Yes! All the way! Yes. Yes. Okay, one, one last one, and I really could do this all day. <laughs> Actually, I have done this all day sometimes. <laughs> Donald Trump is all about money, but Democrats believe that we need to overturn Citizens United and make this great nation once again work for the people. That's our job. That's right. That's right. Yes. So look, Washington is a tough place, but I know this, if we don't fight, we can't win. And so that's why I'm here with you. The future of our country is up to you. It's up to the people in this room because you are the heart and the soul and the living spark of the Democratic Party. You are the ones 
who will make it happen. We need Democrats. We need them right here in New Hampshire. We need to elect Maggie Hassan to the Senate. We need to elect Hillary Clinton to be president. We need to make sure that Donald Trump never gets anywhere near the White House. We need people in Washington who share our values. People who believe that we can build a future, not just for some of our children, but for all of our children. We need to fight. Are you in this fight? Are you in this fight? Then we're going to win it. You bet. I didn't know the guy at all uh, before he got the nomination. Quite frankly, I didn't expect the nomination to be clinched uh, until June 7th at the earliest. Uh, so I never had the time uh, to put the time into talking with uh, Donald about just the country, about principles and policies. It's very clear to me uh, that Hillary Clinton is in no certain way going to be advancing our principles and policies. She's, she's promising another Obama term. Uh, and it's also become clear to me through my conversations that Donald Trump, somebody I know, uh, is comfortable with these principles and these and, and these general policies, and it's basically coming to that conclusion, which you can't do over the phone one time. It, it takes a little time to make sure you have a comfort level with these things. That's a good way of putting it. Yet another Republican, a uh, top Republican, goes down <laughs> for no reason, with no actual information on what it is that really convinced him. Just good conversation. He seems super psyched. He seems super psyched. <laughs> Let me read the totally Washington Post. <laughs> Mr. Ryan, Paul Ryan, Paul Ryan, think about this. The guy who I think most our great think hope yes. is the Republicans' great hope is an honest, good, principled, principled man of character. The Washington Post says this, on Thursday, Mr. Ryan capitulated to ugliness. It was a sad day for the speaker, for his party, and for all Americans who hoped that some Republican leaders would have the fortitude to put principle over partisanship, job security, or the forlorn fantasy that Mr. Trump will advance a traditional GOP agenda. This is so sad. What did, I mean? We well, started had, listen, it right if yesterday. He had a good reason. Yeah. I want to hear it. I'm all for it. I'm all for those meaningful conversations, leading to something and hearing something really good from Donald Trump about what exactly he's going to do to lead the party forward or help make America great again. Tell me what it was, Paul Ryan, because you just sold out. You just well, in, sold out. in fairness, Mitch McConnell said it was the judges. I mean, he sat here Tuesday. Mitch McConnell said it was said the judges. It was the list I said of judges. to him, Nicole, is there anything Donald Trump has know, ever said in his campaign or his right. life that would lead you to believe that he will keep his word on the judges? And he right. had nothing. Right. Mark, what do you think? He's got two alternatives, and this this is a, he believes Trump will point nominate more conservative judges. He wants tax reform. Trump would sign tax reform that Hillary Clinton wouldn't sign. I mean. It's not his first choice or his top 100, but of the two left remaining of people he could endorse, he had no choice. He had no choice? He what no about not endorsing? Choice. He had no choice. He's the Speaker of the House. He's trying to get legislation passed. One of two people will be president come January. He had no choice. I think it's amazing he delayed as long as he did, and I think he delayed probably to about the, almost the last possible minute. Minute, but the, he is. This is the Republican nominee picked by Republican voters. I just want to say because I didn't get the chance to say before Please. what those people did in San Diego is outrageous, Disgusting. and law enforcement, law enforcement in San Diego really, really dropped the ball. Yeah. You can't let a situation like that occur. I agree. And 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 I I'll tell you. The Cleveland Convention, if the Cleveland police don't don't do a huge debrief of the people out in San Diego and figure out how that happened, the, the okay. convention's going to be a um, but, but just Ryan had no choice. To your point of Ryan had no he choice, had no which choice. is pathetic, because this election is unlike any other. The rule book has been thrown out. So that no choice thing, put it back into the 80s and 90s and early 2000s, because there are new rules, and people ought to start living by their own rules and living by their principles, and Paul Ryan can do that. Let me read from the Post, because certainly you wouldn't want to hear this from me. This is fanciful. <laughs> this is Paul Ryan, uh, when he talked about feeling like like Trump can really stand up for the agenda. 
This is fanciful, as Mr. Ryan must understand. Judging by his wild swings of position over the years, Mr. Trump does not believe in much of anything. The, convic the convictions that he does hold against free trade and U.S. leadership abroad for dividing the nation by religion and ethnicity are antithetical to the principles Mr. Ryan has said guide him. Having secured the nomination without Mr. Ryan's help, President Trump certainly would not feel bound by any assurances that Mr. Ryan believes he has heard from the candidate. Paul, he's not going to do anything for you because you did this. He's not going to pay you back. It's pathetic. He sold out. I'm sorry. He did have a choice, and he made one that was weak. Let's bring in NBC News correspondent Luke Resser, who covers Capitol Hill. Luke, read between the lines for us uh, in the Ryan op-ed. Is he trying to say something else without saying it? Am I missing something here? Well, good morning, uh, Mika. I think there's a few things at play here. Uh, what Mark said I agree with is that he's the Speaker of the House of the Republican Conference. There's over 250 Republicans there. A lot of them are now starting to go over to Trump's side, many of them committee chairmen. So he was between a rock and a hard place. He was on this island as the only congressional Republican leader that had not endorsed Donald Trump. So it was not a question of if, it was a question of uh, when it was going to happen. All that being said, the spin from Ryan World is that over the last couple of weeks, they've had really positive conversations between the staffs and that Trump and his people have essentially committed to in the first 100 days of the Trump administration working with Ryan on issues where they see eye to eye. So issues like tax reform that you just mentioned, not issues like free trade, not issues like entitlement reform where they are on very divergent paths. All that being said, Paul Ryan next week is going to unveil the House GOP agenda. It is titled, quote unquote, a better way. What's the first issue up next week? Poverty. It is their belief that Donald Trump and his team, after the assurances given to their team, will take the House GOP agenda and either run with it this election or at least go with it when he becomes president. They believe that because Donald Trump has no concrete domestic policy and they control the floor of the House representatives, the most important domestic policy role in the country, that they will in fact have the playbook for the first 100 days and Trump can either work with them or not. This is an olive branch and they think that by, uh, just by the nature of what would happen, they'll have to. So. I think Ryan, over the course of getting to know Trump, perhaps got some assurances from his staff saying, hey, we can work with these guys. A lot of this was organized by Paul Manafort, who has longtime connections with a lot of people within the House GOP leadership world. Uh, but I can tell you from conversations I've had also, this was not easy by so, any means for the speaker. So, so Luke, let, let's get back to the numbers that you just mentioned. How much of uh, Paul Ryan's endorsement of Donald Trump yesterday do you think had to do with holding together a potentially recalcitrant group of, uh, of GOP congressmen? I think that's part of it, but look, the House GOP conference, they have now come along to, to Trump, but a lot of them have different problems with him. Is he severely conservative enough? Uh, there are questions about his role in the executive branch and whether he would be respectful of the legislative. I think what Ryan did was try to get some assurances for some of those guys that, hey, Trump would be a uh, guy we could do business with. And also this idea that Hillary Clinton, as you saw in that op-ed, uh, is four years of liberal cronyism, just like President Obama, that we can't see again. Uh, but let's flash forward. Let's say there is a President Trump. He's going to need Ryan. And Ryan will be the only person who, in theory, could cobble together the votes for anything that Trump wants to do. Uh, so Ryan, to some degree here, I would argue, is while certainly looking weak to the outside world, internally is exercising some internal power of saying, okay, if this does happen, we're going to go on the issues we see eye to eye on, and we're going to go to the issues that I'd be willing to work with you on. And also, by the way, there's a big caveat here in the op-ed. If he wants to speak his mind, Ryan's going to allow himself to do that. And he's already done that with the ban on Muslims. He's already done that with Trump being slow to disavow uh, association with the KKK. And I would imagine if it got really ugly on the immigration reform front, Ryan would probably speak up again, not only to protect the brand of the Republican Party, but also his own future, which if Trump goes down 2020, 
Look out. How is he going to explain that? Well, the Republican frontrunner was dealing with more than just the fight over vets today. He was also defending his attack on a federal judge. U.S. District Court Judge Gonzalo Criariel is presiding over the lawsuit against Trump University, a now defunct real estate seminar set up by the candidate about a decade ago. During a campaign speech Friday, Trump spent more than 10 minutes hammering this judge, and here is just a bit of those remarks. I have a judge who is a hater of Donald Trump, a hater. He's a hater. His name is Gonzalo Curiel. And he is not doing the right thing. And I figure, what the hell? Why not talk about it for two minutes? The judge was appointed by Barack Obama, federal judge. I mean, frankly, he should recuse himself. The judge, who happens to be, we believe, Mexican, which is great, I think that's fine. They ought to look into Judge Curiel, because what Judge Curiel is doing is a total disgrace, okay? But we'll come back in November. Wouldn't that be wild if I'm president and I come back to do a civil case? Trace Gallagher has more. Trace? Megan, these 381 pages of documents related to Trump University that were unsealed and made public by a San Diego federal judge are essentially playbooks that detail exactly how Trump University was run. Everything from convincing prospective students to pay up to $35,000 to enroll to teaching them how to use tax breaks and financial shelters to maximize profits. The school's real estate training was said to be blessed by Donald Trump himself. In fact, Trump claimed he personally chose the instructors, but later in a deposition admitted that he didn't pick them, in fact, didn't even know their names. Trump and the now defunct school are being sued by a number of students who claim they were defrauded. But as you heard in his epic 12-minute tirade, Trump believes Judge Gonzalo Curiel is giving him a raw deal. And the Trump campaign is now actively supporting the claim of judicial bias. Watch. I think what's really interesting about this particular judge, as Mr. Trump refers to him as a Trump hater, is he even mentions on his judicial questionnaire that he was a La Raza Lawyers Association member. This is an organization that has been out there organizing these anti-Trump protesters mm -hmm. with the Mexican flags. They are pushing it. Judge Curiel has not responded to Mr. Trump's tirade, but did release a statement saying the defense had not met the bar to keep the documents out of the public eye, saying, quoting, the defendant became the front runner for the Republican nomination in the 2016 presidential race and has placed the integrity of these court proceedings at issue. The trial date is scheduled for November 28th, and Trump's lawyers say the GOP nominee will testify. Of course, by then he could be the president-elect. Megan. All right, Trace, thank you. And there's an important clarification on what you just heard there about Katrina Pearson's allegation against this judge. I'm going to get to it with my panel. Joining me now, Trump supporter and attorney David Wohl and Ben Shapiro, former Breitbart News Editor at Large and Editor-in-Chief now at DailyWire.com. Good to see you both. So that right, allegation by Katrina Pearson is wrong, and I just want to correct the record. La Raza Lawyers Asso Association is completely different from the group that's organizing the anti-Trump protest, which is National Council on La Raza. They are not affiliated, and they are not the same. That was an error by Katrina. Uh, having said that, I'll ask you, Ben, about the appropriateness of going after a sitting federal court judge and many mentioning the fact that, quote, he is Mexican, also wrong, he is American, he is not Mexican. No, he was born in Indiana, but, but this is typical Trump. Again, it's not a surprise that Trump is going after people he feels victimize him. This is sort of what he does. But to, to go after the judge on the basis of his ethnicity uh, is, is a little bit bizarre, given the fact, again, that, that his ethnicity really has nothing to do with the case. And it demonstrates, once again, that, that for Trump, who has plenty of grounds to go after this judge, by the way, the fact that he's an Obama appointee, as you heard mentioned by Trump, the fact that he has l relations with, with groups that Trump finds unpleasant, all those are fine. But, but to go after his ethnicity just demonstrates that, that for Trump, Trump, there's some sort of bizarre connection between the ethnicity of the person and the idea, the ideology the person must hold. I don't know why him being a Mexican would even be relevant to the conversation, especially when he's not from Mexico and his parents are Mexican. David, why would it be? Yeah, I don't think it is. I think it's a non sequitur, Megan. Trump why does he keep mentioning tons, it over many, and many. over when he <laughs> rips on this judge? Yeah, I think he's, his ethnicity is Hispanic. He's from Indiana. Non sequitur, Megan. The, the issue of him going after this judge, though, 
I got to say, you know, this is how is this any different than Barack Obama in 2010 at the State of the Union when he ripped, he excoriated Supreme Court justices also who were sitting totally right in front of him about the, and about the Citizens United case, Megan. Adeline, he intimidated wasn't it? them. He bullied them right in front of him. And you know what, Megan? After so that incident, so are you justified bad behavior by pointing to other union. bad behavior? Well, Megan, I'm just saying, and you know what, Bill Burton, by the way, who is Obama's press secretary at the time, you got to listen to this. He said, I'm quoting, one of the great things about our democracy is that powerful members of government at high levels can disagree in public and in private. And this is one of those instances. Wow. This is all it is, Megan. He's got the First Amendment right. To come he out does have issues, as Ben really? has pointed out. Really? And it's frustrating him because I've reviewed this case. It should have been, dis this case, it should have been dismissed. A long time no. ago on, on a summary judgment motion, no question no. about it. No, I mean, Ben is not a lawyer. David and I are lawyers. I completely disagree with you on that. And the Court no, of Appeals. Actually, I am a lawyer. The, oh, I'm sorry, Ben, I didn't know that. And the Court yeah. of Appeals, the Court of Appeals actually upheld this. It wasn't all this judge. Listen, you can say that there's no merits to the case and Trump will get his day in court, but to go after the, the judge as a, quote, Mexican and hater takes it to a different level, Ben. Well, absolutely. And, and, and the fact that Trump defenders have to rely on Barack Obama was a bad guy. Therefore, if I got, our, our guy does the exact same thing, it's, it's just doubly as awesome. It, it, it's, no, it's typical of the Trump campaign. I mean, why, no. why, why is it? OK, so why? So you tell me, David, why is it better that Trump did it now that Barack Obama did? It? I thought we were running against Barack Obama if we're no, on no, the right. No. I thought the idea was Obama's no, no, a bad guy. The point guy. is, the point is, you know what he said immediately after they said, I love the Mexican people. I've got. Well, millions of Mexican supporters. He clarified it immediately. David. So, you know, don't take it out of Come context. On. The majority, Megan, the, the, the substance of this criticism of I mentioned it because I want to take this opportunity to express my love for the Mexicans. Come he on. Well, Megan, you know what? Sometimes you have a slip of the tongue and I submit to you. He does it That's repeatedly. all it was. That's, that's the thing that's so was. crazy about it, David. I don't know the why guy, he's he doing this. Nobody, listen, listen. Nobody give Trump a hard, hard time if he said, I don't like this judge. I don't think he's been fair to me. I'm going to get my day in exactly. court. And I'm going to win this that's case. Great. Go for it. That's fine. Said. That's right. right no, right. it isn't. That what we're debating Trump, here is his, is his taking it a step further, personalizing it, going after the guy's ethnicity, and he does it every day. Time. Is, you know, you know something, Megan. He did. He is a member. He, maybe he misconstrued that membership in La Raza Lawyers Association. I don't know. <laughs> there are a lot of people that have gone after him because of his border policy. I don't know whether he felt this judge should should recuse himself because of those issues. That's what but he's Megan, saying now. He doesn't need to recuse himself. Now. There is no Megan, basis for the know, judge to recuse him. This yeah, is what he does. If, he, if he, he creates does, a face. Uh, uh, he creates uh, a bias where none exists, and then demands that the person no, be no, removed. No, no, no. That Megan, that is right not after the case with this judge. Right after Mr. Trump. Right after Mr. Trump complained. Last week, about the judge, the judge releases the documents immediately right thereafter. Now, I submit to you, does that create a, an appearance of impropriety? It may well do so. And if he doesn't recuse himself, it may be up to Mr. Trump's lawyers to file the motion for recusal with a different That's judge. Amazing. I've done okay. that so many times ahead, under these basically, circumstances. You don't know. So basically, you, you insult the judge, and then when the judge does something that he's perfectly allowed to do under the law, and there's a motion before the court in order to release these documents, then you say he has to recuse himself. So you create the you issue, don't, you don't find and the only anything, way to resolve you don't find the anything. issue is Hold for on, the judge let, let ben to... Finish. Hold on, uh, hold on. So, so you create the issue, and then the only solution is for Trump to get what he wants. And by the way, all this is a whole slip of the tongue nonsense. When your tongue keeps slipping in the same direction, at a certain point, you sort of have to figure that there's a little bit of intentionality to it. The guy's tongue is a slip and slide. He doesn't just slip every so often. Okay, I got that. I leave you at home with that mental image. Great debate, guys. Thanks for seeing us. Thanks for being here.